thank you for coming to our webinar. This is our fourth in our series of webinars, the Hiring Outlook for Informational Information Professionals. And these webinars are hosted jointly by Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics and Drexel University's Center for the Study of Libraries, Information and Society. The goal of these webinars is to try to bring people from different areas of the information fields in to talk about their work, um, talk about the information fields as they see them, and just to teach us about what they do in the field. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Denise Augusto, and I am the director of Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics master's degree in Master's of Science in Information. So welcome to everybody. We're glad to have you here. Let's see, I'm keeping an eye on the waiting room here to let more people in. Uh, today we have two guest speakers. First, we will have Alexandra Winsler, who's the product manager for technical services at uh, Autographics. And next we'll have Katie Aronoff, who's senior director of solutions architecture at Exlibris. Welcome everybody and let's hear what they have to say. Alexandra? Hi there, Denise. Do I sound okay? I can hear you really well. Oh, I guess we should ask before we get started um, if anybody in the crowd would like to tell us a little, send us a text anytime you have questions uh, in the chat. And anybody want to tell us where you're from, um, if you're a student, faculty, professional, it'd be great to hear a little bit about you. Sorry, Alexandra, I realize I should back up and do that. No, that's great. Uh, so hello everybody, I'm Alexandra Winsler from Autographics. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some career paths and hiring information for information professionals, um, specifically talking a little bit more about working at a library software vendor. So I work at Autographics. Uh, we've been in business for over 60 years and we have um, our products in use at over 6,000 libraries and organizations throughout North America. Uh, the four main products that we work with are uh, Share It, uh, our resource sharing ILL product, which is where I work most closely with. Uh, but we also offer Verso for our ILS automated library system, Montage for our uh, content management system, and research it for our search and discovery system. Uh, I'm a product manager, uh, sometimes abbreviated as a PM, and I'm really the liaison between many departments. Uh, my focus is always our product, our software, uh, but I work closely with uh, a huge group of colleagues that all do different things here at Autographics. Uh, I coordinate testing of new features and how to roll out new features with our development and QA departments. Um, I compose strategies and outreach and mar with marketing and administration. Uh, and I help uh, convince new customers to join us and help keep current customers happy through sales and customer service. So I really get to work with pretty much everybody at our company and that's been really rewarding. One of the key things I do as a PM is I give uh, sales demonstrations. Uh, it's a critical part of signing up new users to use our product and every sale is preceded by a demonstration. Sometimes it's on site, uh, sometimes it's virtual. It's been very virtual lately. Um, and sometimes it's very quick and sometimes it's very in depth. Uh, one of the key things I need to do as a product manager is adapt to figure out what demo makes the most sense for the people I'm presenting to. Um, sometimes that means adapting to show certain features. Uh, as you probably know, different types of libraries have different priorities. So an academic library may need to see me, ha have me walk through, you know, requesting an article in our interface, whereas a public library might really want to be interested in our CERC policy matrix or something like that. Um, being able to say that I have library experience really helps put potential users at ease. Uh, it lets me answer detailed questions they have about the product and provide sort of a real world use case for how you might use our software because uh, I've been in their shoes and can share that library librarian's perspective. The other big role I play uh, as a PM is writing specifications. Uh, and when I say specifications, I basically mean writing an outline for a new feature or a software change, something that we need to work on and improve and expand in our product. 
Uh, when I do that, I describe the situation they're currently experiencing uh, and compare that to the workflow they want to have instead. Uh, and my goal is always to write it kind of like a real life story so that they get to have the step by step experience of what somebody's trying to do uh, when they use our software and what they'd like to do. And when I write something like that, I need to consider all kinds of details like are we integrating with any outside systems or other areas of the software? Um, do we have a plan for migrating people who are currently using the software in a certain way? And what should the defaults be when we roll out a new feature? And all of that needs to be thought about as we uh, improve our product. Uh, a little bit more about me specifically, I do have my master's degree in library and information science. Uh, and I've done project-based work of all kinds at libraries of all sizes, uh, circulation, reference, cataloging, preservation, even events and workshops. Um, and I've done that kind of work at academic libraries, museums, private libraries, and most importantly, public and volunteer-run libraries. Uh, on screen here is a picture of uh, the private library I worked at, which was a historic paid membership members only library called the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, and I spent many afternoons and evenings in that reference desk uh, on the right by the windows. <laughs> you might be wondering, why should I work at a vendor? Um, and it's a good question to ask. I think, first of all, it's, it's an interesting uh, alternative opportunity to work in the library and information science world. Um, vendors are driven by their bottom line, uh, so we stay in business by making sales and we aren't directly funded by grants or government budget. So this would be a very different sort of workflow compared to an actual library. Uh, if you've ever had the feeling that you think you can do better than the software you're using at your job or internship or for school, uh, you might want to consider working at a vendor and that way you can bring change to the actual software from the inside and the changes you make are going to benefit librarians throughout the industry and throughout the country. Um, I know I make a difference and make an effort to ensure that our software follows standards and practices needed by librarians. Uh, it's a key part of making sure that we're meeting everybody's needs and it could be an area that you could be uh, most useful in. And you could also help balance innovative new things that have never been done before, along with things you know people need to get done right away. In terms of hiring people to work uh, at a company like Autographics, we're looking for people who have an experience with a variety of different library workflows. Uh, it's probably not news to a lot of you that libraries do a lot of different types of tasks. It's not just cataloging, it's not just circulation. There's a lot that goes into it in all areas of uh, the administration and, and workflow. Um, being able to have at least a little bit of experience in a lot of those areas is a great benefit. It means you can help inform more areas of the software and you can know more about which workflows might need to be uh, conducted in which ways. Uh, likewise, having an experience with a variety of library types is a plus. Um, Different libraries have different needs. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a busy public library versus an academic library or a closed collection museum, they're all going to have different focuses and priorities. Um, being able to be in touch with what's going on in those different types of environments can help inform um, what their software decisions look like and where, what areas they need to focus on there as well. Having an experience with a variety of different library systems is also a plus. That might be something as simple as you've worked with a couple of different vendors that do the same type of work. Uh, maybe, you know, one library used this ILS and a different library you worked at used a different kind of ILS. Or working with different types of software, even just within one library, different pieces do different things. You might see, um, you know, a mark editor is a certain application. You might be using a different one for checking out CERC. Uh, you might be using a different one for getting statistics. Uh, being able to have those different experiences are really appealing. It helps, um, helps people like me who work at Autographics feel like the candidate has experience with a different variety of different interfaces and can help sort of bring together different ideas of what worked here and what maybe didn't work here and how that could be brought together to make a really good workflow. Um, I put these up here. Uh, these are industry standards 
for integration with software. Um, you should learn these or at least explore these. You don't need to learn them today. You don't need to be an expert or anything like that. Um, but I included them because I use them every day at my job and having a little bit of knowledge about them was a big part of why I got hired. Um, I've shared these slides uh, with Denise. So if you wanna click on these links or learn more, you can ask for that and take a look. Um, the good news is that you might already be interacting with some of these types of standards in your current jobs or internships or places where you interact. Uh, for example, if you're uh, working with a cataloger who's searching Library of Congress, they might be using that first standard there, Z39.50, to search their catalog. You know, if you have a self-checkout machine at your library, it's probably using SIP or SIP2 to connect to your circulation software. Uh, so if you even just begin exploring the places you already work, you might find that some of these are already at play and, um, you know, getting more familiar with them can only help uh, your knowledge of the software industry and your knowledge of what libraries are using and how they connect to different software. The great news and the information I would, if you take nothing else away from us talking today is that um, I can't emphasize enough that you already have a lot of valuable experience, even just right now. Um, I know that having, you know, having a master's degree in library science or information science is a big leg up. Not a lot of my colleagues have that same degree, even though they work in the library software industry. Um, some of our proposals from our customers and users out there require that vendor staff have MLS degrees or that the team leaders on those projects have degrees. Uh, and that'll put you ahead of uh, other candidates that are out there and other people that are working at um, similar positions. Uh, the, a big part of why this happens is because librarians really want to make sure that they're working with somebody who understands what they're doing and how libraries use software. Um, by being able to sort of speak their language and help put them at ease, uh, that's something that not every candidate has. And uh, folks like you have a big leg up in that area. I would say if you see a job posting at a library software vendor that's asking for something like three to five years of experience, I'd say apply anyway. I think, uh, you know, your your current experience and education in the library world has so much value unto itself that it really puts you ahead and you should give it a try no matter what. Some of the other things we look for when hiring a candidate. Um, some of the essential skills for a product manager or somebody working with library software, communication and knowing who you're communicating with is a big part of it. Um, being able to communicate about technology, they sort of go hand in hand. Um, knowing when to get into the details of how things fit together and what's actually going on step by step and when to make a sort of more bigger picture marketing strategy perspective. Um, being able to talk about both or even just talking with the librarian and, and being able to talk about what they're going to do in the interface is a, a big part of the job. And as we mentioned earlier, having a variety of experience with different library workflows and types is a big, is a big part of it. Uh, if you're looking for an edge, there are some other things you might look into either if they're of interest to you or if you're just looking to expand your horizons a little bit. Um, having experience in quality assurance testing or building testing automation is always a plus. Uh, having IT or back end experience with SQL or database structure would be uh, uh, an easy fit with us as well. Or even having developmental or coding experience with things like APIs that connect uh, software to each other or uh, JSON or solar structure for searching and record storage. Um, I know Drexel has a usability program, which is really great. Uh, it's not something I've seen a lot of, and I think it's a really interesting opportunity. Um, if you're somebody who's focusing on usability and you want to work at a library software vendor, I would say that you definitely still need some knowledge of how libraries work. This might be something you can get from just, you know, using your library a lot, um, but that's a big part of this. Um, but that being said, Having a combination of libraries, information science, and usability together is really powerful. Uh, and honestly, I'd love to see more folks like you out and applying for positions in the world uh, of the software vendor. Uh, last but not least is my contact information. Um, I'm sure we're gonna take a lot of questions today, but if you have more that you think about later or you're watching this as a recording, please feel free to reach out. 
um, if you're working on a report or a study or you just want to pick my brain about your experience and skills, um, please feel free to uh, give me a call or an email. I'd love to hear from you. So uh, thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much, Alexandria. Uh, really interesting. Thank you also for the plug for uh, UX. We do have in our master's degree, three different majors, either library and information science, uh, HCI slash UX or digital content management and students who are majoring in one of those areas can minor in another one as well. We really try to encourage to students to do this because it does provide that, that broader background that you're talking about. Great, thank you. Um, quick poll, people who responded to my uh, request to say who you are and where are you from. I counted four people who are currently master's students and one who's a recent grad. And it looks like you guys are from all over the country, which is very exciting. We're so happy to help you. Uh, would you like to take questions, a few questions now, Alexandra, before we move to Katie or where'd she go? There she is. Um, whatever works best. Um... You can talk to us both at the end, or if there's something that really jumped out, feel free to speak oh. up. <laughs> sure. Um, somebody actually just texted me in the chat and asked, is there a way to get access to the previous three webinars in the series? Yes, all of the webinars in the series are edited after they're, they're recorded and um, then they're posted to our college's YouTube channel. So if you just email me, I can send you the links to them. But thank you. Uh, we might as well take some questions now since we're doing well on time. Okay. Ideas or questions for Alexandra? Oh, I should tell you, should, you, can, you can chat or you can also speak. I think we should be able to hear you fine. Arjun, did I pronounce your name right? Let me pull up the chat. Um, uh, Arjun says, I am a library professional from India. Any thoughts on whether there should be some liaison sessions between vendors and librarians time and again? You know, um, that's actually a good question. Before we got started, um, Denise and Katie and I were talking a little bit about some of the on-site things that aren't happening as much right now. And I know at Autographics, we make a point of being at library conferences throughout the year. And that's a big place that we either present um, new things coming up with us or connect with libraries about things like standards uh, or even just hear from boots on the ground type people of like what, what's new, what's happening in the world at your library. Um, so that's, that's been our traditional way of doing that. Um, because a lot of conferences are going digital, we're going to be looking at different ways to connect and try to have that same conversation. Um, I will say the other thing that we do at Autographics is that we do have a pretty active user group. Um, so the administrators that are our customers, we meet with them uh, quarterly, usually a little bit more than quarterly and uh, checking with them about how are things going with our product, what kind of enhancements they wanna see. We let them vote on you know, what's a priority for them. Um, so we are definitely in conversation with librarians um, as much as possible because that's a big part of where our success comes from. Thanks for the question. Here's another one from Ah, here's an interesting question. Um, somebody asked, how will the focus of the company be different 36 months from now? Ooh, I like that one. What do you think? Uh, I think I think finding new ways to share has definitely been on our minds lately, especially with um, how libraries are changing, whether it's for curbside pickup and having really good tools for tracking those kind of workflows, uh, or even just sharing different e-resources and making sure that that is uh, as fast and easy to use as possible. Um, believe it or not, we do still see a lot of people who are looking to connect with library software and uh, get that up and running. So I think in some ways it's, it's not that different. Um, but I think how, uh, what features get priority and what people are, are looking to use uh, is evolving even as we speak. 
Um, and uh, I'm, we'll, I'm sure we'll return to some of our favorite library workflows uh, down the line as well, being inside and and uh, you know being able to connect with events and things like that. But for right now, the tech has been a really helpful part of it. I'm not sure if that was a question. Um, I see in the chat there is a question. Do you have certain libraries that are beta testers for your software or do you use communities of practice? Um, we do uh, a little bit of something different where we do have our team do quite a bit of testing and research and really put new features through their paces uh, as much as possible before they even really get out there. Um, but our user group is really our go-to sort of um, power users, if you will. They help inform um, what we want out of a feature enhancement and uh, can sometimes give us sort of a preview once we have it up and running. They can help walk through some of the workflows and see what they think of it. So uh, we go with our, our user group as our main connection point for things like testing and trying out something new. And another question, uh, given the fact that software incorporates new developments in the workflow features over time, do you also hold sessions with IT staff of librarians? Uh, you know, uh, that's something again that we would typically present big changes and in some sort of event setting. Um, I know I'm involved also in things like committees for different standards that are out there. And I get a lot more overlap with sort of the IT backend librarians and, and committees like that. Um, I will say IT librarians and IT staff are definitely heavily involved whenever we're getting a customer up and running. There's a lot of decisions that they make and decide how they wanna um, roll out and, uh, and uh, onboard all of our um, our new features and tools that way. And do we, we do tend to get feedback um, when we do that as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Very helpful. Um, there will be more time to ask questions later. Okay. But for now, let's switch gears and hear from Katie. Great. Uh, thanks, Denise. And thank you so much for um, for having us and for hosting this session. I think this is a really great opportunity for me to hear from students in the field and also for you to hear from us about a career path that is maybe still considered to be a little bit unusual. I want to talk about a few different things. I didn't prepare any slides. I, I have some pictures I can share maybe at the end, but I decided I would I would wing it a little bit. And I think that actually a lot of what Alexandra said about the general um, things to be aware of with working with vendors, what we look for in hiring, how we operate in our relationship to the customers. I think a lot of that holds true for many of the major library vendors. So that's a really good grounding for what I wanna say. I want to talk about my own um, career and educational path and how I got to where I am. And I want to talk a little bit about what I do today and also what I look for when I hire for my team. So as, um, as Denise said in the introduction, I am the Director of Solutions Architecture for Ex Libris in the Americas, and I always feel the need to translate that. I noticed um, shortly after I started working for Ex Libris that my mom really didn't understand what I did at work. Um, and when I was a reference librarian, my mom understood. Um, it was, I have a colleague who refers to um, certain jobs as Richard Scary jobs, like the busy town books for kids where like everybody has a clearly defined role. Being a librarian is a Richard Scary job, working for a library vendor is not. Um, so what I do is I am in charge of a team of product and subject matter experts that primarily is responsible for product demonstrations and preparing responses to bids. 
if any of you work in the public sector in particular, you may be aware that purchasing um, for public institutions often requires you to go out and get at the very least quotes for what you're buying. The bids team prepares written responses to that type of thing. And the solutions architecture team is responsible for product demonstrations, very similar to what Alexandra was talking about. We may go out and uh, I would say the shortest demos I've done are under an hour. I've also spent three days on site with different libraries, um, you know, three days, nine to five, sometimes you even have lunch with them <laughs> type of sessions. So it's, it's really a whole range of things. I am responsible for everything in North America, South America, Central America. So I have people on my team based in Seattle, in Cleveland, in Austin, Texas, in Mexico City, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, we're, we're really more than ever an international operation. Um, and that's been a very interesting thing for me over the last few years. How I got here is a little bit roundabout. And I think that's one of the points that I want to make is that career paths and hiring and things like that are not always linear. They're not always straightforward. And in some ways you should expect the unexpected. And by that, I also mean that you should be open to trying things and you should be open to paths that you may not have known about and that you may not have considered. I originally went to library school because I had this idea based on my senior thesis as an undergrad that I wanted to be an archivist. I was a history major. I was so excited about going and being an archivist. My first semester at Simmons, I screwed up my registration for classes. Um, I missed the letter that they sent to my house saying now is the time to sign up for classes. And I didn't get into the introduction to archives course and I was devastated. But then once I started to make friends in the program and I started talking to people, I realized this may have been a blessing in disguise because based on what they're telling me about this course, I don't think I actually wanna do that. So I ended up following a much more generalist library path at Simmons, which at the time was kind of the norm. I think that their program has changed a little bit, so I don't want to misrepresent what it might look like now. But in like the 2007 to 2010 timeframe, a lot of people just did this kind of generalist path. And that's what I did. I focused a lot on metadata and cataloging. That has served me really well in my current work. And I did that because those were the classes that were the hardest and that challenged me the most. And I really liked the cataloging professor. So, you know, the classic advice of like, take the class where the professor is the best, that holds true um, in library school. And if any of you still have a semester or two left, I would say, you know, do that. Um, after I finished my master's, I worked in academic libraries, which had kind of been my plan. I think getting into the first job, I did it in a slightly sideways manner. I ended up in this strange position where my job title was special projects librarian. Special projects is a red flag, by the way. Um, but I did that job for two years and I learned a lot. I ended up working in circulation. I worked with our usability focus group on staff. I did some work with faculty. It, it was interesting. Um, after that, I worked in reference at a community college, um, and I loved that. I loved it. I loved the students. They were willing to ask questions. Um, I even kind of enjoyed working afternoons and evenings mostly by myself in a basement. There, there was a lot. It was an unusual job, but it really worked, and I also really liked the people I worked with. In community college libraries, you don't really, you don't have a lot of financial resources. So if you want to try something new, you have to work with what you have. And our library director at the time had been the director for a very long time. She had worked at the college for more than 30 years, and she really had this entrepreneurial spirit. And everybody on the staff kind of picked up on that. Um, if you wanted to try something, it was acknowledged that the worst that could happen was that it didn't work. Um, and that helped me to learn and grow a lot. So I think there's also some value in kind of to the extent that you can in the process of finding jobs and applying for jobs, go where the people seem like they're your people. Um, and I kind of knew with that job from the interview that I liked them and they liked me. So I was very happily working in my night times in the basement job. And I got a message on LinkedIn from a recruiter and it said, are you interested in hearing more or learning more about a position with a major library software vendor? 
And I said, sure, I'd be interested in learning more because I think that when somebody asks you that type of questions, you should say yes. You should always go out and learn more about what there is to learn more about. So I said yes, and I had a series of conversations with this recruiter and then um, with the hiring manager at Ex Libris. And within about two weeks, I had a job offer. And this was two weeks starting on like, I'm not joking, December 23rd, I think. So it was like, I was talking with these people basically over Christmas break. I went into the office for an interview right after New Year's and suddenly I had a job offer. And at that point I freaked out and I said, what have I done? Uh, my plan was to be a state employee forever. And I was perfectly happy doing that. Obviously I decided to take the job. It was a leap of faith. And I figured the worst thing that happens is it doesn't work out. Um, so it has worked out. I've really enjoyed being at Ex Libris. I've been here for almost seven years. I work with some of the smartest, most interesting people. And I love working with libraries. For those of you who are students at Drexel, you use our software every day. If you go and you look things up in the library, you're using Primo. If you work in the library at Drexel, you may be using Alma. And that's that's our that's our stuff. That's what I work with. Um, so it's been a really interesting ride, and I I I love what I do. I just really I feel like this is this is the place for me in a lot of ways, and I could not have predicted that. Um, I think to shift gears a little bit and talk about about the job market and hiring and and some various things. I've hired for a number of positions on my team over the last uh, three and a half years or so since I've since I've been the director. And hiring is really not easy. It can be very fun and rewarding in a lot of ways. You get to talk to a lot of people, but then there are the days when it's a drag and you just want to find the person and you want to find them now and you want them to be like six months or a year into the job where they know what they're doing. Um, so it's, it's not always easy, um, but it can be very rewarding. And, you know, these days the market is tough. Um, a lot of academic institutions, and I should say I work primarily with academic institutions and uh, maybe government and special libraries as well. A lot of the places that I work with are, they're on hiring freezes. And that's a really tough thing when you're in the job market. I got into the library job market myself to circle back a little bit. I finished my master's in 2010. Um, and I'm sure that some of you here are, you know, you've been in the workforce for, for longer and you may have weathered the, the financial crash in 2008 and the subsequent fallout from that. Higher education was seriously, the, it was defunded in a very serious way in 2008 and the years following. To go into the job market in 2010 was to go in in the midst of that fallout. So. I think it's somewhat disingenuous to say I've been where you are, but I have been in a similar position and I sympathize with those of you who are out there right now. It is very tough. That money that disappeared 12 years ago has not come back. Um, so we're now dealing with the kind of domino effect of that series of budget cuts that happened more than 10 years ago. Um, I think that when you are applying for positions and considering what you might do, keeping an open mind about where you'll be and what you'll do is very important. Uh, when I was looking for, for jobs, when I ended up working at the community college, I almost didn't apply to that job because when it was posted, it was part-time. And I said, well, I want a full-time job. Like, I don't want any of this part-time stuff. And my boyfriend was able to like see reason where I couldn't. And he said, there are so many things that this job has going for it. It's 15 minutes from our house. Um, you know, it's academic. It's the type of experience that you want. He said, you should apply and it doesn't mean that you have to take it. And he was totally right. I took the job. It did become full time after several months. Um, the director was able to get, get it funded. So I think, you know, keep an open mind about things and be willing to to stretch yourself and consider alternatives that maybe don't fit your ideal. I think a lot of people go through, you know, there's this idea that a career path is one thing that leads to something else and then it leads to the dream job. It's often a series of 
stumbles and fits and starts and setbacks and jobs that you love and you know jobs that you love like you love a crazy relative like the because sometimes it's there are things that drive you nuts but the job itself fundamentally you really enjoy um so be open to different things and be willing to take some chances i think that ultimately is what gets rewarded in a time when things are tough is if you have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit um, about your own career and what you're willing to do. Speaking for myself as a hiring manager, when I'm hiring, maybe the most important thing that I'm concerned with is what can the candidate bring to my team? What do they offer? What are they, what's their special skill set? And what are they, what are they giving to us? Um, and this is something where I think a lot of people, your instinct is to talk about, or when you're looking for jobs, you think about what the job will do for you. And obviously putting food on the table is the most important thing. And everybody knows that. But what I wanna know about as a hiring manager is almost the reverse of that. What can you do for the job? Because I have a team of people and I'm probably looking to fill certain holes in our product coverage, in our skills in other ways, maybe even in geographic location. So when I get on the phone with a candidate for an initial HR screening call, and I talk to like 90% of the people that HR forwards me, I just say, yes, I'll talk to this person. Um, the, the most important thing you can do is tell me what you have to offer. Um, I, I kind of know what a job does for people, but tell me what you have to offer for me and for, for the team. Um, that I think is the single most important thing. Um, having a lot of those skills and pieces of experience on your resume that Alexandra was talking about are important. That's what gets you in the door. But then what advances you through the process is showing an interest in the position um, showing curiosity and showing me that you've done your research and you've done your homework. Um, I have hired people who on paper were not the strongest candidate, but they came in and they did a great presentation. Um, things like that really can make a, a big difference. So show that you're invested in the process and that you're willing to learn. And I think that really goes a long way. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about in relation to hiring is that sometimes in, in hiring in libraries and in many different fields, you see behavior um, with some of the people who do the hiring that I refer to as gatekeeping. Um, they're trying to, like, have you ever seen a post on Facebook in one of the various library groups where somebody says, I've been reviewing resumes and they're all wrong. And this is what you should and shouldn't do when you're applying to jobs at my library. Posts like that drive me crazy because all it is telling you is how to get a job with that person. And it's not, I don't think it's actually advancing what we need to advance to bring different people into the profession. So this is something that if you are on the applicant side, be aware of the signs that somebody may be doing this. There, you know, good applications can look different. Um, if you get across the information to me that you know what you're talking about and you're interested in the job, that can happen in a few different ways. Um, and then I would say, if there's anybody on here who is a hiring manager, you wanna check your own tendencies to start to do this thing. Um, you know, And it can be as simple as reading resumes in a different way. Don't look at the candidates' names and where they went to school. Um, don't don't expect the resumes to be set up in a certain way. You know, if you're a recent graduate, it's okay to put your education at the top. Um, the wind up with a lot of this is that this is the type of hiring behavior that sets up discrimination. And I think that if we want a more diverse field, if we want more diversity in libraries and in library vendors, and we need it on both sides, then we as hiring managers in library fields will stop doing this type of thing. Um, so I just wanna put out the word that this is something I see quite a bit and keep an eye out for it. Be aware as a candidate that's going, that it's going on. If you are a hiring manager or you are one, you know, five or 10 years from now, think about this. Um, and I think on that note, that's the end of my little monologue here. <laughs> um, I can show you a picture um, from, 
I said I would share some pictures. So let me share some photos of, let's see, here's a good one. Um, this is my team at the Ex Libris Global Kickoff in uh, 2019 in Berlin. Um, we had a kind of a fun event that was a, uh, what do you call it? Like a beer garden, I guess. Um, and there was an inflatable pretzel and you could take group pictures with the inflatable pretzel. So back when we used to go places and see people, um, these are some of the people I work with day in and day out. Um, everybody here in the picture, I think with the exception of one person is a librarian with a master. So um, that's, uh, that's the picture. That's what I had to say. I saw a couple questions come in um, during the time I was talking and I'm happy to answer them. So here's a question. Um, what was your career path through Ex Libris? Where did you start? So I started as a solutions architect um, and I've been with the same team all along, which is uh, one of the paths that you can take in, in a vendor. I was, uh, I was doing demos and eventually the opportunity uh, arose to manage the team. And over time, I've added different responsibilities to what I do, but I've kind of been in this arena the whole time. Um, this type of work is, is often called pre-sales. Like we are adjacent to sales, but we're not part of sales and we support the sales process. My team is part of a global pre-sales team that covers the entire world more or less. So there's a, another version of our team in Europe um, and there's one in Asia Pacific and across the three different regions, we cover pretty much everybody who needs coverage. Um, so that's that's been my path. And as I said, I've, I've kind of taken on more responsibility in several years in being a manager. Um, I am happy to talk with anybody about management and what's challenging and rewarding and difficult about that too, uh, but that may be a kind of a separate conversation. Um, and then another question is, um, as somebody who has myriad career experiences, how do you think those who wish to acquire different experiences motivate themselves to push the boundaries um, in this fast changing information milieu? So there's, um, I think that if you want to acquire different experiences, you should put yourself out there in a position to acquire the experiences, like be the person who volunteers for weird projects at work. Um, that's a good way to get yourself involved in different things. Don't do it to the point that you're stretched too thin or that you can't focus. But if something comes up, um, be, be that person. I got a lot of mileage when I was working in libraries out of free or low cost local conferences. I'm lucky enough to be in the Boston area and there's a lot of that here. And I would assume that for those of you who are based in, in the Philly area or in DC or, or somewhere else in the Northeast that you probably have access to a similar selection to what I had here. And then these days with everything being online, um, you know, go to anything you can. Go, go to talks like this, go to various user group meetings, um, go to, you know, those, those things like skill shares and unconferences and whatever they're called. Like if it's, if it's free or it's dirt cheap and it's out there, go to it and meet people and listen to what people are talking about. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, okay, here's a great question. Somebody says, you mentioned that special projects was a red flag when you worked as a special projects librarian. Could you elaborate? Um, I think special projects is what people in academia call a job when they're not sure what it does. Um, and I didn't really recognize that at the time. It can be a good thing, but you just wanna check, um, figure out the story there. <laughs> so it's sometimes kind of a catch all for like a, a job that is like, um, let's see expression, jack of all trades and master of none. And that can make it really hard to focus and it can make it hard to, um, to kind of get a good base of experience. I'd like to ask the same question someone asked of Alexandra. Sure. How do you see the company changing or how might it be different in three years? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's the type of thing that I am involved in um, quite a bit. I'm involved in discussions of that with other people in, in the leadership, in the 
in the region, um, you know, in North America, and also the the sales leaders and and people like that. Um, where I see things being different specifically at Ex Libris in the next few years is that I think our product focus will change a little bit. We've been very focused on the the core library products, um, and for us, that's really been ILS products or you know these days what people would call LSPs or library service services platforms. Um, so to give a little bit of history, Ex Libris has been around since the 80s. Um, and our original product is Olive, which plenty of libraries still use, um, including some here in, in the Northeast in our part of the country. And then over the years, Ex Libris has acquired different vendors or been acquired um, in some cases. And we've built up this portfolio of things like link resolvers and electronic resource management systems and all of those kind of like pieces and parts of library systems, as well as, you know, two legacy ILSs and a next gen LSP. Um, and there's a lot going on in that market, but it's not the only space that there is these days in libraries or even in higher education. So we're starting to work more um, we're starting to work more with research and supporting academic research. We have a mobile platform that's um, that's really interesting. There are a couple of other things in the works that I'm not necessarily in a position to talk about here, but um, it's it's a I think about saying if we have a, a platform like Alma, and Alma really is a platform that integrates with different systems in various ways what else might that power? Um, so where I see things being different in three years is a focus on different areas that um, universities and research libraries might also support, like the research process on campus. And I also see our geographic focus becoming broader. Um, we've had customers in Latin America for a long time, but these days that is the region that maybe takes up the most of my time <laughs> um, in a lot of different ways. So that is, uh, that's, I think it's a few different things, but that's what I see. Um, here's an interesting comment in the, in the chat um, from Erica who says, um, I graduated in 2008 from undergrad and the recession hit me hard. What I learned from the recession was to be flexible and open, which I still do when it comes to positions. Thanks for the advice and encouragement. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. What what can I say? I think it's true. My sister graduated from undergrad in 2009, so she was in that kind of same cohort in a lot of ways and and it was tough and it still is very tough. I think that if you're like if you're in your 30s right now, you've lived through this more than once. Um in a lot of ways and we are not in the world that we were told we would be in like when I was in high school in the late 90s by any stretch of the imagination. So I think there's a lot of uh, kind of dubious job advice out there. And, you know, some of it you can ignore, but I think keep an open mind that that will always serve you well. Um, here's another question that 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 is good. Um, you spoke about this a little bit, and I would love to hear more about how your previous professional experiences will help were helpful to you in your role as a solutions architect, as well as your current role. Um, so some of this for me was that I had acquired, when I was in library school, I worked um, in, I was working at Tufts University for most of the time that I was in library school. And I had this job where I was in the, like the central administration. And I learned about things like purchasing and budgets and working with the different schools within the university. Um, I used to send people to do things like take pictures of baby squirrels at the vet school. Um, so I had a lot of uh, exposure to different things going on on campus and that experience, it helped me to understand how universities work. And that's really come in handy and knowing what the budget processes are like. I mean, at the time, I, it seemed boring and sort of punishing work, but <laughs> it's it's been so good to know that. I also have experience working in journalism and communications and being able to write and do it persuasively is something that's important. So uh, I'm a big believer in the idea that wherever you go, you bring your, period, you, your previous experience with you and you roll it up into what you do. Um, 
there's one more question and, and I wanna make sure that we're not missing questions that Alexandra could be answering or questions for both of us, but here's a, this is a good one. Um, what are the entry level roles at Ex Libris? I've seen support analyst and technical support analyst in my research. Do you have any advice for people applying to those entry roles? Those roles in support are among the entry level positions at Ex Libris. A lot of them are gonna be based in the Chicago office, but not exclusively. Um, at least for us, you may see some things, similar positions that are um, part of a ProQuest business unit that may be based elsewhere. But to, to avoid going down that rabbit hole of like who's where and doing what, um, those are really good ways to get in the door and to get your feet wet. Um, for support, a lot of what you're doing is problem solving, but it's customer centric problem solving. So somebody may put in a support ticket that, you know, links are not working correctly in Primo and you have to work with them to figure out what's going on. Um, you need to have the technical understanding to do that successfully, but you also need to have the people skills to have what can be sometimes a difficult conversation with somebody. Um, you know, in support, you're sort of exposed to the things that don't work and not the things that do. So, um, good people skills are are important in support. If you have other types of customer service experience and you have a library degree, that's a good way to be considered um, for roles in support. Some of the other maybe entry-ish level positions would be some of the things um, on the content team working with metadata, um, like the metadata analysts, and I forget the exact job titles, but the people who work with the content for the various knowledge bases and maybe do the cataloging, um, that's something that you can get into in a sort of entry level capacity. Um, and sometimes some of the professional services positions, that's the product implementation groups, some of those are appropriate um, for people who are kind of entry level in the library world, but it does help to have some practical library experience um, for those in particular. Uh, one question I missed earlier, uh, what do you feel are your most useful professional organizations? Mm -hmm. um, right now, being on the vendor side of it, I find myself more in tune with Honestly, just things like newsletters from companies, seeing what's new, seeing what's being explored. Uh, I mentioned earlier things like being on um, standards committees to see if there's something we need to adjust and make it official. Not always the most exciting, but um, when I was on the library side of it, I found that being somewhat specific was helpful. Um, I had an arts background prior to doing this. So being on like the R list group in New England or being on a technology focused uh, regional group uh, or even just being on the sort of general library organization that, but that was specific to my geographic area was a good way to connect in a little bit more of a personal way. It, just so it wasn't, the pool wasn't so large that it felt sort of like you're never gonna be heard or, or connect with somebody in there. Um, so that those, I you know, I was probably on dozens of little groups and listservs at the time, um, but the ones that I felt most fulfilling were a little bit more specific, either topic or geographically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that sometimes the, um, the big library organizations like ALA and ACRL, they're big. And if you wanna make connections, the regional groups and regional conferences are a really good way to start. Um, here in New England, ACRL New England does some great programming just to give a plug to them. Um, but some of the kind of small to medium-sized national conferences are a really good way to, to get some exposure. And I know that some of these require money, but like my favorite conference is ERNL, which is about electronic resources. It's in Austin. If you like tacos, figure out a way to get there. Um, I see some people on camera nodding. So I'm, I'm not the only fan of this conference for the food, but it's also a really good conference. So, um, you know, if you going to ALA as a first timer, it's gonna be overwhelming. So if you wanna start getting involved in professional organizations and conferences, go regional and go small to medium. All right, we just have about three more minutes. Um, any last questions or comments? While people might be typing, I do just wanna 
throw out there that um, I don't think any of us are actually that far away from your shoes right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about what you already have and bring to the table and how you can sort of explore and and what you can uh, do to help you know, connect with something. And I, I, it really is um, not that unattainable to have an interesting opportunity you didn't expect or an unconventional mm-hmm. opportunity that really leads you down uh, a path to something like working at a vendor or even working at, you know, corporate or museums or something yep. that's unex- unexpected. Uh, so um, I just wanted to, to add that. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. And something else I would say is that sometimes within the world of libraries, you see a little bit of stigma attached to this concept of like vendors and especially the big vendors and, you know, Ex Libris is part of ProQuest, which is about as big as it gets. Um, And, you know, I, obviously I resent that for personal reasons, but, you know, the, the way I see it is that libraries and vendors need each other to be successful. Um, And if you want as Alexander said earlier, if you want the products to work the way you want them to work, then build good relationships with your vendors. I work with people who have gone back and forth between the customer side and the vendor side um, more than once in some cases. Um, and it's, we, we all have to work together um, and just be a little bit aware when I was talking about gatekeeping before, I think some of this also applies to people who will kind of say snobby things about, you know, all oh, those people who work at vendors. Like there's this kind of, there's a model of like, of uh, moral or academic purity in some circles, I think particularly with academic libraries. And I think that that's dangerous um, for a lot of reasons. This is another area where I could get on the soapbox for a long time, but you know, you can do good fulfilling work in many places without compromising your principles um so definitely yeah we need a lot of library focused people as well as technology focused Mm -hmm. vendor focused people so yeah don't be discouraged to apply absolutely thank you so much to alexandra and katie this was fantastic Uh, and thank you to everyone who came and participated in the audience as well If you're interested in receiving the recordings, I will send the link to participants, but you can also email me, Denise Augusto at Drexel. I guess I can put my email here in the chat. I'm putting my email in the chat as well. Um, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn and other places like that. So yeah, thank you to Denise for organizing this and thanks to everybody for joining us. And our next in this series, if you like today, you'll like the next one, is <laughs> November 30th. We have two speakers, one who will be talking about open library initiatives in digital libraries in California, particularly, and another speaker who is the head of music libraries at University of Pennsylvania. So offering really a wide perspective, I think, on available professions and jobs within library information science. Thank you so much. And if you're in my class, Everybody, you can log off, uh, go back on our regular Zoom link. I'm thinking about 7.15 and we'll check in and talk about everything we learned in the webinar. So thank you again so much to Katie and Alexandra and thanks everybody, bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks good night. Again. Have a good night. Thank you.